praise today as we join in singing our gathering hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. And you may remain seated. <laughs> Holy, 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 our hearts have become dull to the power of your liberating good news and numb to the ways it has been used to oppress. We confess the times we have sat on our hands when you were nudging us to raise them in service to our neighbor. We confess the moments when we have been silent when you were nudging us to speak out for those who have no voice. Forgive us, reshape our hearts, Fill us with your words and peace and love and grant us courage to share them as you do with us. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this time and your beautiful creation. We ask that you fill this sanctuary with your presence and your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your words, with your life, and send us out to be your people, sharing that good news with all we encounter. In your son's holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. Now we'll hear our reading today. Thank you, Craig. reading from Revelation 17, 1 through 6, and 19, 11 through 16. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters, 
With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of her. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Later, I saw heaven standing over, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
love to have that superpower. And he could feed thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread and some fish. That's way better than flying. Well, that might just be because I'm afraid of heights. But that would be a cool superpower to have. So I need you all to stand up right now. You need to pray. Well, we have to superhero pray today, right? Okay, stand up. Get your best superhero pose. Oh, I know it's so hot out today. <laughs> Trust me, this cape is a little warm. All right, so best superhero pose. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for your superhero son. Thank, thank you for your superhero son. Help us embrace and grow. Help us embrace and grow. Our own unique superpowers. Our own unique superpowers. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Super Danielle. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters, from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are finding yourself in the sunshine right now and you would like to find a different spot to locate yourself, you feel free to just get up and wander over into some shade if you need to. Do not feel like you have to be, you know, good Lutheran, Scandinavian, whatever, and just, you know, take it. I will not be offended if you need to get up and wander into some shade. So for some of us, since we're talking about superheroes, uh, we were probably quite young when the Star Wars trilogy came out in the late 70s and the early 80s. Anybody remember that? Anybody want to admit that they remember that back that far? I do. And I still remember sitting in the dark theater um, cheering on Luke Skywalker, an albeit whiny superhero, right? But he was still obviously going to be the hero of the story, at least until his twin sister, Leia, showed up on the scene and basically kicked his butt at everything. She was actually super. But we sat there in the dark, cheering silently for Princess Leia and for Luke Skywalker, for the good guys to win out over evil, right? You never, you never cheered for Darth Vader, right? You didn't cheer for evil to win. Even Darth Vader didn't start out cheering for the dark side. He didn't really intend to end up where he did. It was a whole series of small steps that led him to find himself on the side of evil. The only time you did cheer for Darth Vader was when it looked like he might come around to the good side, right? Of course he didn't, but you know, you cheered because you wanted him to. Well, the way the images are set up in this last cycle of visions in the book of Revelation, it's also obvious whose side we are to be on, whose side we are to be cheering for when the end comes. In this last set of visions, we have on the one side, the harlot, right, riding a scarlet seven-headed dragon. She's dripping in gold jewels, dressed in the finest silks and drinking from a golden goblet. At first glance, she seems quite regal and very powerful. And her powerful, majestic appearance is alluring, just as wealth and power can be alluring in real life. But with a look, closer look, John is astute to observe that she is drunk on the blood of the saints that fill that golden goblet. I know it's not the nicest text we could have chosen for a baptism, but here it is and we will get there. She might be powerful, this woman riding on this dragon, but she is anything but regal. The harlot represents Babylon the Great, a name for anywhere and anyone whose love of wealth and power leads them to violence against anyone who threatens to take what they believe is rightfully theirs away from them. Anyone who succumbs to the attraction of their own ego and is drawn far away from God. Upon closer examination, the harlot, in fact, is grotesque. And in the end, the very dragon that she is riding on 
is her demise. The vision takes the destructive patterns of society out to their logical conclusion to see that evil finally falls victim to itself every time. Evil being seen clearly is inherently self-destructive. And on the other side, we have Christ riding on a white horse. His eyes are like blazing fire, it says, and on his head are many crowns. An army rides behind him dressed in white robes, washed and clean, and he himself is dressed in a white robe that has been dipped in blood, his own. The great difference between good and evil being shown here is that evil destroys in order to keep itself alive, while good gives up its own life in order that others might live. Come out of her is the cry as the battle ensues. And we skipped over the great battle, but that is the cry that rises up as it begins. The battle that we all hear, that Armageddon, that word that haunts us in movies and headlines. The battle people have attempted throughout the decades to pinpoint both on a map and on a calendar. And the thing is, is that Armageddon does point to a place, the plains of Megiddo. It's the ground zero for the battles that God won on behalf of God's people throughout the millennium. And here in this vision, in these last days, it's the place where God will destroy the destroyers. The battle begins not with a mushroom cloud of destruction, but with Christ coming out of heaven, wearing a white robe dipped in his own blood that he's already shed, that all people might know the salvation of God. Many expect this battle to end with incredible carnage and the end of the world as we know it, right? And yet the armies of God that are following Jesus, they do nothing. They don't lift a finger. The only actor is Christ. And his only weapon is a sword that comes out of his mouth. God's word. God's word that holds the truth about humanity about God's strength and justice and power to transform death into life. That is what will win the day. This isn't about the end of the world as we know it. This is about the end of systems that have oppressed God's people through wealth and power and violence. Not only when those first seven churches were reading this letter, but through all time. This battle is about destroying the destroyers of the earth ruin it and diminish life. So come out of her is the cry that ensues as the battle begins. Because always at every turn, revelation has been about bringing the peoples of any and every time to repentance, right? The revelation is a call again and again and again through each cycle of visions to turn away from that which draws us from God and to turn back to the God who created and redeemed us, who sustains us in this life and in the next. It's a call to live our lives based on different values, values that are grounded in the love and grace of God that are there as a free gift for all people. We see this most clearly, I told you we'd get there, in the waters of baptism. These waters our life. These waters wash us clean and not just Macaria's heart, forehead, but her heart and all of our hearts as well with God's forgiveness that is as wide as the east is from the west. We see this most clearly as we come to God's table, God's feast of victory, where we are fed and filled with God's very life. And it seems easy, right, when we're gathered here together and surrounded by these obvious symbols and reminders of God's grace, of our calling to share it. And it's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? As those symbols fade into the background on your way to your cars later, back to our everyday lives. 
Maybe that's why superheroes started wearing capes, right? Not to keep them warm or to assist them with flying or to make them look regal, but as a symbol of that which we cannot do for ourselves, but is done for us. The mysterious and for us not so mysterious power of the Holy Spirit giving us eyes to see clearly the forces of good and evil at work around us and filling us with courage to know to do what we didn't know we could. Courage that lifts us up above the noise of the world so that we might rise up to be God's hands and feet and heart and voice in the world. Amen. Maybe this week we can imagine ourselves cloaked in God's strength and grace and peace and therefore stand against the destroyers of life we encounter because of it. Now that is something I could cheer for. Amen. Amen.
And now I invite Makaria to come forward with her parents and her sponsor. In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father gives us a new birth into a living hope. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the one body of Christ, the church, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Living with Christ and in communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Ben and Adriana, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Aria baptized into Christ today? If so, please respond. We do. As you bring your daughter to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with an obvious gift and with the responsibilities to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the word of God and the Holy Supper, teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, Place in her hands God's holy scriptures and nurture her in faith and prayer so that she may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Makaria grow in Christian faith and life? Again, if so, please respond. We do. And Uncle Jonathan. As sponsor, do you promise to nurture Makaria in Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Holy Spirit and to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? If so, please respond, I do. And people of God gathered here today, do you promise to support Makaria and to pray for her in her new life in Christ and to pray for her parents, Ben and Adriana, in their calling to be her parents? If so, please respond, we do. Then I ask each of you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the face of faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebel against God, and the ways of sin that draw you from God? Together, please respond, I do. I do. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Okay. <laughs> she wants to see what's going on. I baptize you. Makaria Leto Berger, in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Um, all done. Hello, beautiful. There we go. Let's keep the napkin. Child of God, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. And we light this candle represents the light of Christ that we pray takes up residence in Makaria's heart. I'm going to give that to you, too. And we pray will shine out of her. We say these words from Matthew. Makaria, child of God, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. We give you thanks. Oh God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. 
Sustain Makaria with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. And look with kindness upon Ben and Adriana, parents of little Makaria. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you have given them. Make them wise teachers and examples of righteousness for their children. Strengthen them in their life of faith and bless their homes and their life with your presence in your Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So we have a tradition here. I can't remember if I told you this or not, but the tradition of welcoming little ones uh, into the family of God at Lutheran Church of Peace is to sing Jesus Loves Me. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. So you're ready. Okay, so let us join together in welcoming Makaria to the faith by singing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Yay! Very nice. <laughs> She's very excited about this. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us take a moment to shift in our chairs and share the peace of Christ with others with a peace sign that you can wave at everybody around you this morning. And so we come to God's table of grace, the feast of victory, where we receive Christ's life and the gift of forgiveness for each and every day. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered together by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hopefully, we, we will be communing in our seats today. So if you did not get a communion kit, uh, Wave and Danielle can bring one to you. At this time, you are invited to open those and to participate in communion together as one people of Christ with these words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the blessing of this meal, the bread and the wine, your life that fills us to overflowing with your grace. Might this meal nourish our hearts and our lives and send us out to be your light in the world that all might see and know your grace, your justice, and your peace. In your son's mighty name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Blessed Assurance. Many. Bo-